Hi everyone. So we're going to continue with part two of our lecture um, for the sector era 1955 to 1963. So as we have seen in the previous lectures, the repressive legislation against African workers was cumulative. This is so in two two ways. Firstly, in the straightforward sense of laws piled up on top of previous laws, um, each a greater restriction on the freedom of the people. Secondly, the laws were cumulative in the sense that the laws directed um, the laws directed against Africans as workers, um, and this affected their lives as citizens beyond the workplace. And the laws increasing. Um, and the laws increasing national oppression also could be used to counter their collective struggles to improve working conditions and increase wages. So these laws are generally broad measures designed, designed to eliminate gaps or tighten control beyond specific acts passed over the years. So they aimed to refine the system of migrant labor and influx control and um, dictate the daily lives of African people in South Africa. So these amendments um, particularly impacted African workers as they um, expedited the removal of Africans from ur urban areas um, unless employed there. Um, urban zones were declared subject to influx controls um, backed by labor bureaus where African workers were mandated to register reinforcing the temporary status. So tighter controls were imposed um, in 1957 um, to counter the growing momentum of Congress Alliance mass campaigns. So the amendments um, curtailed freedoms, undermining African workers' association rights, and limiting cross-racial interaction. So despite intimidation, sector activists continued to connect with workers' aspirations. Um, so the 1963 Amendment Act intensified repression, reflecting the government's dominance during this period. So SACTU was in virtually in no position to fight the 1963 Act as much um, of its leadership was being held in prison under the 90-day detention. Um, on large SACTU NIC protest meetings were um, convened in Durban in mid-1963, where 1.2 people signed a petition against the enactment of the legislation. So the total power of decision given to the Labour Office meant that the trade union organizers and officials um, might be endorsed out of the urban areas if their work was not considered in the interest of employers, in, of employers, employees, or in the public interest. So in actual fact, um, the state chose detention without trial, torture, and long-term imprison, imprisonment rather than endorse um, rather than the endorsement of urban areas as the main weapon against sexism. So now linking linking SACTU um, with the ANC. So SACTU joined the ANC-led Congress Alliance and took part in the anti-apartheid resistance campaign of the 1950s. So the SACTU leadership was willing to link with the ANC program of action through the Congress Alliance and this provided an opportunity, but also it raised a difficult issue. It raised a difficult issue. So how could the emergence of industrial unions play a role in furthering the political struggle against the apartheid government, right? So from the outset, the leadership pushed the following question to the forefront. How could the new apartheid provisions be effectively opposed? So let's look further into this. So we have the pound a day campaign. Um, SACTU had a very successful pound a day campaign in 1957, but it later drew a limited response. So the ANC then um, the ANC then called for an end to strike action, leading to tensions between trade union movement <clears throat> and the ANC. So the pound a day campaign is regarded as SACTU's most successful achievement in the 1950s and 1960s demanding a legislated and national minimum wage of one pound a day for all workers. So the campaign touched a central nerve and pinpointed the cause of misery suffered by the majority of the people. Um, the perpetuation of the cheap labor policy fostered by the South African ruling class. So the event which provided the impetus for the prolonged campaign in 
was the Alexandra bus boycotts of 1957. And this was a spontaneous demonstration of mass resistance to, incre to the increasing exploitation in the form of higher bus fares. And this action by the masses reflected a seething pool of working class hostility, and it highlighted the need for a significantly higher wages for African workers. So we can see the Azikwelwa, we will not ride. The 19, this is the 1957 bus um, boycott. So on January the 7th, 1957, um, workers from Johannesburg and Pretoria and the Pretoria Township refused to ride to work in buses owned by um, Pacto. The Public Utility Transport Corporation. So following a one penny increase in, in bus fares, um, this spontaneous act of defiance, it marked the start of a three month period during which an estimated 70,000 workers boycotted the buses among them. More than 20,000 African workers each walked a total of 2,000 miles. They walked in the heat, in the, t in the, in the rain, um, of the South African summer, they were harassed, they were arrested and beaten up by the police. And women walked with their babies on their backs, eh? And they, and they had bundles of washing on their heads. And on one occasion, two young boys were found exhausted by the roadside after having collected a large load of washing from a home in one of the white suburbs several mi miles away. Um, I think this was during a time period where... Um, Black people would take um, the white people's washing to go have it washed in the in the location. Um, they were not allowed. It wasn't signed. They were not allowed to have it washed um, in the in the urban areas. So um, so police had apparently stopped them, accusing them of stealing the washing, and drove them back back to the white woman's home to prove that they were telling the truth. So after the story was confirmed, the police officer dropped them there, forcing them to walk the same distance back to Alexandria again, a total of 18 miles. So cyclists, um, the, so people had bikes, the cyclist tires were punctured by arrogant policemen, and reactionary whites drove through puddles, splashing the workers as they walked. So the boycotters were constantly stopped and searched for no reason. Yet despite all of this har harassment, the people continued to walk as Kwerwa became the catchword that reflected the solidarity of workers throughout the next three months. So seven days after the start of the boycott, the buses were running empty, cause, um, causing Patco a loss of £7,000 um, in the first week, and a further 20,000 people from Moroka and Jabavu Township added strength to the campaign. So, so later in January, African workers and their families began boycotting the municipal, the municipal beer halls, um, attacking another um, very visible institution of oppression. Um, Profits from the beer hall made up an important part of the native revenue account, which was responsible for township amenities, and this action was regarded as a threat of municipal finance. So um, the bus boycotts were a long and brutal fight. The government ended up passing the Native Service Levy Act, um, which required employers to take up a monthly transport subsidy payment for each African employed in commerce and industry. So the government also contributed to the fund. It had been a long and difficult struggle, but the determination of the people had ensured an ultimate victory over attempts by the combined ruling class to impose additional financial burdens on the African worker. So in the course of the bus boycotts, African workers succeeded in drawing attention to their um, poverty wages and employers, and the government were compelled to take notice of their situation.
So early in 1957, there was a newspaper called Umteteleli Wabandu, owned and published by the Chamber of Mines, um, and it conducted a survey of income and expenditure of African families. So the conclusion was that an income of 31 pounds per month was necessary for adequate and decent living for a family of five living in Johannesburg, um, in the Johannesburg African Township. So many promises were rhetorically made, including one by the Minister of Labour, de Klerk, but there was Dololo from the government, there was nothing. Okay. So I'm going to read you a statement um, from SAC2. You can see it in front of you. So workers, you know your wages are too little. Your children are hungry. Prices are too high. You have no money for food, for rent, for transport. Workers only, worker, workers only unity, uniting can help us. This is what we must learn from the boycott. When we stand together, we make our voices heard. If we want more money, we must have strong trade unions. If all workers join with SACTU, we can win these demands. Not promises, but your own unity can get, your, get you your demands. Let us stand together for the one pound a day for an immediate increase in wages. Trade unions make us strong. So SAC2 saw that comrades were ready to mobilize in the midst of the bus boycotts and they seized this moment to introduce the national working class demand, one pound a day. So now on the 10th of February, 1957, SAC2 convened a workers' conference attracting about 300 trade union delegates um, and thousands of unorganized workers. And leaflets were distributed beforehand um, drew the link between the fair increase, increases and the general poverty of the African workers created by the profit system, right? So they said, we demand a minimum wage of one pound a day, including the cost of living allowance for all workers throughout the country, and set to pledges itself to struggle for the achievement of this aim. An intensive campaign began and was carried out on every possible le level. Deputations and memoranda demanding one pound a day were served on employers, strikes, there was mass rallies, demonstrations, there was distribution of hundreds of thousands of leaflets, and um, press coverage occurred in all corners of the world. Um, all corners of the country, sorry. So the bus boycotts, um, they aroused the militancy of the people, and they were now searching for a way forward. SACTU saw it as its duty to organize workers in, in, into trade unions. So during the SACTU launch, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> there was an immediate drive for 20,000 new members, and the emphasis was placed on recruiting all workers into SACTU. So SACTU's recruitment forms were in all languages. They were printed as well as 15,000 badges and stickers. Um, Speaker's notes, speaker notes were issued to all committees, which were given the responsibility to organize mass meetings and local recruitment programs, um, helping workers to frame their demands and take up complaints at the factories. So the factory committees <clears throat> formed <clears throat> wherever, wherever it was possible, were formed wherever it was possible and existing unions were given um were asked to give office space to newly formed unions and officials to give advice and assist um to for the new organization um throughout the year of the campaign the pound a day campaign was formed um in all major centers um and industrial areas were zoned <clears throat> with industrial areas were zoned to facilitate organizational work so educational work assumed a priority and the local committees, they began to print their own leaflets and had to hold mass rallies to mobilize workers around the one pound a day campaign. So in July, 1957, um, Asinamali rally held in Johannesburg. It was held in, in Johannesburg. There was the Asinamali rally and um, the fifth of its kind throughout the country, it drew about 500 workers to, um, from Clark's store 
<clears throat> Pretoria, Johannesburg, and the East and the West, representing some 60,000 workers in total. Hey? So the facto campaigns were again strengthened in 1959 when the Women's March against passes, beer halls, and dipping tanks, um, there was a, a, a renewed emphasis um, on, on, on these hardships. So in 1959, SACTO called for an end um, to these state-controlled wage boards and their replacement by a national legislated minimum wage for all workers of a pound a day. So just to give you some background on these wage boards that I, I mentioned. So the wage, um, the wage Act was established in 1918 and it changed over time. Um, it was a tool that the government used to control African workers. So it was supposed to protect them and raise their wages, but it mainly applied, but it, it, it mainly applied to disorganized indus industries, leaving out farm workers, domestic servants, and government employees. So a group called the Wage Board, chosen by the Minister of Labor, it decided on the minimum wage for places not covered by the Industrial Council um, Agreement. So, however, these boards often set low wages that help the employer and make it hard for the workers to demand a better pay. So the boards would make, um, the boards would just take a long time to make decisions, which delays any improvement really in wages. And trade unions also faced limitations um, fitting with the government's aim to weaken workers' actions. So this connected with the government's plan, especially when responding to sac to wage campaign. Um, Changes in this act made certain industries essential, preventing strikes. So basically the wage act kept wages low and limited the power of organizing labor. So SACTU did some, it really did um, some big commendable work. Um, the work it, the work it did it was amazing in the period 19 and, and then in the period 1959 to uh, in 1960 so they grew nationally and internationally and in some industries the minimum wage it actually slightly went up even though the majority was still earning less than 15 pounds um, a month so some employers agreed to meet with SACTU at a round table conference and SACTU refused to accept the uh, their mm, contention and continue to demand that the workers who produce the wealth of South Africa be paid a living wage. <clears throat> <clears throat> so next, excuse me, we're going to look at the SAC2 housing rent campaigns. Um, so SAC2 wage many, waged a lot of campaigns. Um, another one I'd like to tell you about is the housing rent um, rent campaigns. So this was one of the most effective ever waged as with the one pound a day campaign. So this was a demand for lower rents and better housing. So both were, the, the, you can see they were clearly the consequence of class exploitation under apartheid. Um, so these non-wage campaigns were considered the most enthusiastically, were, were co conducted under the most enthusiastically during the 1960s when state repression reached its peak. So if, even in the final moments of um, above ground activity, SACTU never failed to base its campaigns and goals on the needs and aspirations of the South African working class. So we have, so we have Africans starving their wages are deplorable. There is unemployment, and other and other and another triangle to this exploitation is the housing and the rent crisis. So under the native um, under the native act, Africans um, in urban areas were required to live in designated racially segregated areas, right? Right? Hostels, villages, townships. So only African domestic who stood at the beck and call of their white oppressors in the suburbs were exempt from these restrictions. So using cheap African labor in the construction trade, model townships sprang up on the perimeters of the industrial centers in the 1950s. So associated with, food, with forced removals to African areas was a significant increase in the total cost of subsistence, living rent, living rents payable to local authorities skyrocketed and transport costs to travel the average of 10 to 12 miles 
to work, it now became a matter of daily necessity um, and wages failed to increase. So for many workers, averaging around eight pounds per month income. So payment for transport, rent and food purchase um, and food purchase at work would normally cost like seven pounds, um, leaving only 10 shillings for the month to cover all these expenses, imagine. So in essence, the slum clearance program, program it meant greater suffering and starvation in, in only slightly better, in slightly better accom accommodation. So the government did not care whether Africans could pay this rent. Um, families were living on poverty wages. For example, a tenant made 16 pounds a month. Um, there would be a 20% reduction for rent, it's huge. And there would be very little left for other expenses and practically nothing to survive the rest of the month. So the rapidly constructed townships, the rapidly constructed townships were very poor in quality. They were inadequately, there was inadequate heating during the winter months. It was unbearably hot in summer. There was no electricity, no running water, no inside toilet facilities and no ceilings, no room parti um, partitions and only earthen, earthen floors. Um, so Harry Lutz, as a, a sector leader in the Transvaal FCW, who had worked as a, um, as a surveyor for the city council during the construction of the Soweto township, he recalls that um, houses were just four walls with no internal divisions and no concern um, for the comfort um, and no concern for the comfort of the occupants. So the living conditions were quite, um, were quite appalling. So in Kwamashu, the African township built 14 miles from Durban in the late 1950s. Houses were within a short period of time in bad repair. Roads and drainage systems were poor. Lightning was inadequate. And recreational areas, practically, they did just did not exist. So the same conditions obtained in Meribank, um, an area where poor Indian families resided. So these realities led Sektu to warn the government in 1962 that it was sitting on a ticking time bomb, which would explode if the situation continues. So this would then create debts for Africans. In Guamashi, for example, over um, 45,000 pounds in rent areas were owned, owed by Africans. This was over 80% of the township population, crazy. And in 1953, um, for, uh, and then in 53, and 53, sorry, percent of Indian families in, in Meribank were behind in their payments. So Africans were pr pr prosecuted for this and they were put in jail. So, how does SACTU respond to this housing crisis? So SACTU's response um, to this was the Vits LC and SACTU head office took the initiative on behalf of the township residents. Um, a high profile publicity campaign, expo it, they took on a high profile publicity cam campaign exposing the council's practices coupled with mass meetings and demonstrations and the formation of the Residents Association forced the City Council to curb the most excessive examples of victimization and criminal prosecution. So for example, the council was formed to stop, um, the council was formed to stop sending tenants final warnings where no previous warnings had been issued. Often the final warning reached the tenants after the date designated for payment and um, subsequent eviction. So the sector campaign operated at two levels. The most difficult, but the most successful part um, entailed intervention, intervention on behalf of individual tenants. So an estimated of 90% of rent defaulters earned about three to four pounds a week. So desperate for assistance, these people would then um, would be lined up at the sector office each morning. They would line up at the sector office each morning waiting to speak to Phyllis Altman and others about their respective situations. <clears throat> so in almost every case where either SACTU or resident associations challenge the council, 
the summons against the individual was either withdrawn or satisfactory alternative arrangements were made. So in fact, um, Phyllis Altman discovered later that the council files of individuals assisted by SAC2 were marked don't arrest or don't jail. So a more general, at a more general level, SAC2 and other supportive groups campaigned um, for an end of criminal prosecutions, a reduction in the rent and the rent based on the type of accommodation rather than a percentage of income. So all of these demands were related to the demand for a general increase in the wages of African workers. So a SACTU delegation actually met in Johannesburg, um, in the Johannesburg City Council, pointing out the crucial relationship between low wages and rent arrears. So on, a specific, on specific objections, other specific objections were made. Um, for example, SACTU called for an end to the lodger's fee whereby the municipality could charge for children 16 years over living at a home with their parents. Eh? So in 1962, SACTU's annual conference added new demands, which included the wavering of all areas, a lowering of house rentals to 75% um, per room and 50% reduction in public transport costs. So there was mounting pressure initiated by SACTU um, on the city council. Um, and this led to, in 1962, this led to the city council to agree to end criminal prosecutions, but only with the added counter threat of increased evictions though. So the council also proposed that employers automatically deduct 25% of their wages for the workers in rent areas but SACTU and others, they objected to this. Um, okay, so SACTU said in a press conference, the scheme will ensure that the city council gets its rent and then the Africans will be free to stop on the rest of their salaries. There would be, of course, be no problem with rent collections if the Africans were paid a living wage. Okay, so SACTU and MK. So after the Sharpeville massacre in 1960, um, and the ANC and SACP formed, and the ANC and SACP formed Mkondo Sizwe in 1961, most of SACTU's leaders joined the underground military organization. So even during the five months um, declared state of emergency, following the tragic shop for massacre, SACTU head office gained um, again served demands on all national employers, organizations for increased wages. So now by 1959, SACTU had, had a membership of 46,000 in affiliation. And this led to an intense debate about the relationship between unions and the nationalist liberation movement. So then some believe that SAC2 was weakened by its links to the ANC um, and banned CACP in the 1950s, but others thought these links were important. So now looking at SAC2 in 1962, um, SAC2 in, insisted for a legislated, a legislated national minimum wage. And in January 1962, SAC2 prepared a draft bill and presented it to the Minister of Labor Copies were also sent to members of parliament and the bill was given national press. So, was the great pressure that the all-white parliament was forced um, for the first time to debate the issue. So the demand was rejected largely on the advice of Professor Stian Kamp, chairman of the wage board, who had been consulted by the cabinet. So this confirmed SACTU's position that the wage board served as the class interest of the bosses. It was not something that was manufactured for the workers. So let's look at some victories, um, some victories by SACTU. So as you can see, SACTU placed emphasis um, on the one pound a day campaign and um, in 1963, um, Rem, Rembrandt, 
tobacco company, it announced that it was paying a minimum wage of um, one pound a day to all employees. No credit was given to SACTU for its relentless campaign, but SACTU correctly claimed this is their victory, even though limited. So as you can see, the call for a legislated minimum wage um, awakened the state and the capitalist class to the realization that they could not combine, they could not continue to extract profits from workers without a further sharpening of the class struggle. And some argue that the main victory was in the education of workers about the nature of racial capitalism in South Africa and the organization of thousands of new trade unions. So the majority, the, the major vehicle of trade union education was SACTU's newspaper, which was called Workers' Unity. The paper was, was um, produced continuously between 1955 and 1962, except during the periods of heavy repression, such as the state of emergency. Um, so SACTU developed a series of 10 lectures um, covering a broad range of issues from sweeping analysis of from the sweeping from a, um, sweeping analysis of capitalism to concrete methods of organizing factory committees and articulating demands to employee employers. So these lectures proved to be the most effective manner of offsetting some of the difficulties of organ organizing. A national sector school was convened in May 1956, when you, where unions sent younger workers and potential organizers to study the series of lectures and listen to the experience of veteran trade unions, unionists, some of whom had been banned in the early 1950s. So among these lecture, lecturers were Ellie Weinberg, Ray Alexander, Al Friedman, John Ngadimeng, and Leon Levy. So plans to continue these schools never fully materialized, but the LCs made a frequent use of these lectures um, throughout the years. So the success of the 1960s and 1961 stay at home pointed to the fact that most, the most militant responses to the strike call came from these industries where SACTU's organizing campaign um, had made the most inroads. So with SACTU assistance, legal actions reduced the frequency of suspensions and the victimization um, of railway workers. So, so this is Wiesile Mini. He was um, one of the founding members um, of SACTU. So many, many in SACTU's leadership were killed, imprisoned and harassed. Among those um, was SACTU's national executive member, Wiesile Mini, who was hanged on a, and on a framed up charge in 1964. So Wiesile Mini was an executive member and organizer of the Port Elizabeth Local Committee, and Mini is rem remembered as one of SACTU's most militant leaders. So in 1963, while working in the Port Elizabeth SACTU LC, Vesile Mini was arrested along two other ANC militants, Wilson Kainga and Zinaki Lemkaba, also Port Elizabeth local committee members. All three were charged with committing acts of sabotage and complicity in the death of a police informer in January <coughs> excuse me, of that year. So held in solitary confinement under the 90-day law, these three men were finally sentenced to death in March 1964, and they were hanged in the Pretoria Central Prison um, on the 6th of November 1964. Also, another interesting fact is Vesile Mini composed many, many, many apartheid songs, um, the most famous song being the one sung by Miriam Makeba Nanzin do Demnyama. Um, he composed many songs. He was also a great um, poet and a great composer of these songs. So his, this execution set a precedent in South African legal history as three other men were hanged for the actual murder. So count, countless other workers were killed in the course of the struggle for trade union rights in South Africa. So many of those who escaped um, this brutal victimization either went underground <clears throat> or into exile. And state repression saw many SACTU leaders and members arrested, 
and by 1965, sector was effectively destroyed and MK activities took priority, but MK cadres were jailed or hanged. So, Wiesele Mini was a trade unionist. He was known as the organizer of the unorganized um, because of his courage and his tireless efforts to organize workers. Mini was tasked by sector to organize the metal workers. He became the metal workers union secretary and the Eastern Cape Secretary of Saktum. Mini was one of the first batch of trade union leaders to join Mkonto with Sizwe. He was um, the first trade union leader to be executed for MK activities in 1964. Ben Torok, um, a previous co-accused of Mini in, 19, in the 1956 treason trial, was serving a three-year term in, in the... Um, Pretoria Prison for MK activities at the time of Mini's execution. So Ben Taruk recalled the last moments of Mini, Kainga and Mkaba's lives in Sachaba, the, which is, Sachaba is an official ANC journal. So Taruk says, the last evening was devastatingly sad as the heroic occupants of the death cells communicated to the prison in gentle, <clears throat> excuse me, in gentle, melancholy, melancholy song that their end was near. It was late at night when the singing ceased and the prison fell into uneasy silence. I was already awake when the singing began again in the early morning. Once again, the ex, the ex, 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 ex creatingly beautiful music floated through the barred windows, echoing round the brick ex exercise yard, losing itself in the vast prison yards. And then unexpectedly, the voice of Wisile Mini came roaring down the hushed passages, eventually <clears throat> standing as a, on a stool with his feet reaching up to a barred vent in his cell. His unmistakable bass voice was enunciating his final message in Isikosa to the world. He was leaving. In a voice charged with emotion, but stubbornly defiant, he spoke of the struggle waged by the African National Congress and his absolute conviction of the victory to come. So, we are also going to look at dock workers' resistance in Saktum. So, in Durban, the dock workers known as Onyati or Buffaloes in Zulu had a history of resistance to. Back in 1930s, um, they protested against taxes and passes and fought against monopoly of beer making. <clears throat> so they kept striking in the 1940s during a time of intense conflict. In 1959, over a thousand Steve Doris, Steve Doris are people employed at um, at the docks to load and uh, and up uh, to load and unload ships. So they defied the native um they defied the Native Labor Act and went on a seven-day strike to demand higher daily wages. So they were threatened with eviction from the employer's um, employer-owned home and had to go back to work. So even though the Native Labor Board raised their pay a bit, they were also accused of illegal striking. Almost a almost hundred were found guilty and fined. And now in the mid-1950s, the, the Durban dock workers faced a major issue known as the Togot labor system and this system paid migrant workers daily wages for their work at the docks but it lacked security and regular income and in 1956 the dockers went on strike demanding an end to the togot system and were introduced and the introduction of monthly contract contracts for stable income now, in 1957, plans were made to limit the number of African Steve Doris, which sparked a stay-at-home protest. Despite difficulties, the dock workers displayed um, their determination and went on strike, demanding better pay. And after negotiations, their wages were increased. Now, in 1958, efforts were made to eliminate the toga system and establish a centralized compound system with more control. So African foremen were integrated into the system, sparking another strike in 1959. Workers were also dissatisfied with the wage board's decision regarding the wages and the working conditions. So the introduction of a weekly paid permanent labor force was initially seen as a positive progress. 
but low wages led to rejection. So workers demanded fair pay and resisted excessive overtime. Employers responded harshly by dismissing the entire workforce and hiring what? New workers. Um, I mean, the reserves were, you know, literally a reserve to employ new workers. Um, so despite workers' efforts, the collaboration between the state and the employers suppressed um, their resistance. Okay, I think we've been through this slide. So now we're going to look at um, dock workers in Port Elizabeth. So Port Elizabeth um, was actually a scene of another fierce struggle carried out by railway um, and dock workers. For a long time, these workers had demanded increased wages, but their demands had been brushed aside. So at the beginning of 1957, the, the workers embarked on a go slow strike to draw attention to their plight. And on the 26th of February, they decided to start work one hour later and stop one hour earlier and not work overtime or on weekends in support of the demands for a wage increase. Um, so railway workers joined the dock workers demanding an increase um, from the present four pounds a month to seven. So the bosses now called the police and special branch and the special branch and the army um, were called to be on standby. Um, so now what what did the bosses do? So what the bosses did is they brought in um, Steve Doris from Cape Town in East London, which was called Scab Labour back then to do the job. Um, and these workers, um, we still have many actually have his trade union, the Steve Dores, um, um, dock workers and Steve Dores union, it appealed to these other uh, workers in East London and Port Elizabeth to not take up the work that the government um, is giving them, bringing them in a scab labor. He told these other Steve Dores that they should reject the scab labor that the government wants to use, that the bosses wanted to use. So these new scabs that were brought in, they, the, the bosses lied to them and they told them that because of the bus boycotts that we spoke about and because of the train boycotts in progress, it was impossible for the workers to come um, in Port Elizabeth to come to work. They were lying. They were replacing um, these workers that were on strike with scab labor. So now... Armed police guarded the ships, ensuring that there was no contact with the strikers. And Governor Becky reported from Port Elizabeth at that time. And Becky said, Governor Becky said, from March the 2nd to the 7th, the harbor looked like a city which had recently been occupied by a foreign invading army. The armed might of a government, the armed might of a government that records African labor as a possession of a dominant white capitalist class strutted about in a great show of strength. Okay, so now workers returned to, they returned to work on the 4th of March, but the shipping companies were only prepared to allow them to resume work if they surrendered unconditionally and dropped their demands. So workers refused and they were swiftly marched off the harbor. And, and as they left, the bosses brought in, the government and the bosses, bosses brought in convict labor to come do the job now. So they brought in the scab labor and now they bring in the convict labor. And on the 5th of March, the railway, the rail workers were locked out and replaced by prison labor. So now militant leaders like Vuisilemini, Caleb Mayakis and Alvin Benny led the campaign to support the harbor workers within the SAC2 local committee. And SAC2 appealed to the international working class to denounce the use of convict labor. And the ICFTU, it took a lead in issuing a warning to the South African regime. Um, there were other um, trade unions which also refused to, to, load, um, to load goods that were loaded in the Port Elizabeth docks. Um, they also issued a stern warning to the South African government 
Um, and within hours, the Minister of Labour, Schumann, conceded ordering a ban um, on convict labour at the docks. So this was, um, this was a, a win, but it came with a price. So when I say it came with a price, so even though because of this international appeal um, that because of the threats, um, international threats, um, the, the Minister of Labour um, withdrew the convict labour, um, the Steve Dores were brought back into work. They were rehired again, but they were even given lesser wages than they had before. And the railway workers were dismissed and they had their... Um, I think it's permits, work permits taken away and um, because they were considered um, unskilled, but the Steve Doris were, were skilled workers. So it came at a price. The victory came at a price. Okay, so now when we look at um, SAC2 and international solidarity, so one of the different types of solidarity with the oppressed people of Southern Africa, um, international working class, Solidarity is the most important and potentially the most effective because it emanates not from charity or humanitarian motives, but rather out of a recognition of common class interests and shared conditions of, um, of life under capitalism, right? So SACTU also forged links with the International Confederation of, trade, um, of Free Trade Unions and the World Federation of Trade Unions. So between 1955 and 1963, SACTU head office in Johannesburg established um, regular con contact with both major international trade union federations, the International Confederation of Free Trade Unions, the ICFTU, and the World Federation of Trade Unions, the WFTU. So 20 national trade union centers in Africa and at least 50 such bodies in North America, Europe, Asia, Latin America, Australia, and New Zealand. So most of this work was handled by, I mentioned her earlier, Phyllis Altman, the Assistant General Secretary between 1956 and September 1963. Um, when she was banned from all trade unions activities, SACTU actually always sought support from, um, SACTU always sought in, uh, support from all international trade unions and federations. So in the Americas, the Cuban revolu Revolution was a tremendous inspiration for SACTU's struggle in South Africa. And special tribute was paid to the Cuban victory against the imperialist supported Batista regime, and most importantly, against racism. So in turn, the Cuban trade union movement expressed its support for the principled lead SACTU had taken against racism by requesting a copy of, the SACT of SACTU's constitution in 1959. So in the African continent, SACTU consistently promoted rank and file trade unionism and an internal component to the decolonization and the national liberation struggle. So Afro-Asian um, solidarity conferences and all people's conferences were regarded as a strategic continental effort to unite African people with their brothers and sisters um, in the Trinidad world against division created by the neo neo-colonialist interests. So set to stood in solidarity with workers from many, many different countries. So although set to um, and the Congress Alliance leaders were frequently prohibited from traveling to these conferences, um, set to regularly pre uh, prepared memorandum documenting the worker struggle and presented the case for workers' unity throughout Africa. Um, numerous resolutions of support were passed on behalf of workers in Sudan, Nigeria, Cameroon, Tunisia, Somalia, Nyasaland, which is modern day Malawi, Morocco, and Ghana, and the French and the French Congo. So in the British protectorates bordering South Africa, SACTU fulfilled its obligation to come to the assistance of workers' movements whenever it was possible. And in 1961, Three SACTU executive members traveled to Basuto land, now Lesotho, to advise on trade union problems and to help draft a bill for trade union rights and the protection of workers. And in June 1963, in a letter to the High Commissioner for UK Protectorates, 
fact to condemn the use of British troops to smash a general worker strike at Mbambane in Swaziland. In these cases, in these cases and, and others, um, fact to circulated information on strikes in the neighboring countries to affiliated unions and urge them, if possible, to contribute financial assistance. Um, this reminds me, I recently met an archivist um, from Amsterdam, and he was actually, during, um, during the struggle, he used to actually type SEC2 to, to pamphlets um, or leaflets, and they would type them, I think in Amsterdam, and they would they then they would come distribute them um, in South Africa and I think in other places too. So there was real international solidarity during the struggle. So now we are going to look at May Day. So May Day is um, observed on the first of May, and it is a global celebration of workers and their rights. And um, originating from the labor movements, demand for better working conditions in the 19th century, it commemorates historical struggle for fair wages, the eight-hour workday, and improved labor rights. So people around the world um, engage in rallies, demonstrations, and, and, and events to advocate for labor-related issues and to highlight the importance of workers in society. So while it focuses, uh, while the focus can vary by country. So May Day serves, it serves as a reminder of the ongoing efforts to ensure better treatment and conditions for workers everywhere. So within South Africa itself, SEC2 persisted in the face of government hostility to organize all workers around May Day campaigns. The tradition of May Day, it celebrate, its celebrations have a, a long history in South Africa dating back to this century to the progressive trade unions of the 1930s and carried out in the 1940s by Sinetu and its um, affiliates. So in 1961, the Minister of Labor wrote to Sektu, and he says, I have advised you that it is not government policy to approve of wage determinations. The Industrial Council agreements which provide for May Day as a public holiday. So the impending suppression of communism act which allowed the state to declare um as un as unlawful any organization it considered to be furthering the aims of communism it led the transvaal anc and senetu the johannesburg district communist party and the transvaal indian congress to call for a, a one one day general strike on the first of may 1950. so the strike led to violence in many african townships um, 19 black workers were killed and 38 injured as a result of police attacks. So against this background of intimidation and repression, SACTU attempted to revive May Day to its rightful place in the political calendar of the South African working class. So workers were encouraged by Francis Bard, militant a militant leader of the Food and Canning Workers Union in the Eastern Cape, to hold demonstrations and celebrations um, in their homes, halls, factories, and streets. So throughout the year, pages of the Workers' Unity, um, the SACTU newspaper, were filled with May Day messages to the workers from SACTU affiliates and international trade unions. So in the early 1960s, with no support from the South African trade union movement, um, SACTU and particularly the South African Clothing Workers Union organized May Day meetings and demonstrations to further promote SACTU campaigns for the recognition of African trade unions, a, nation, a national minimum wage uh, of a pound a day, and an end to job reservation in industry. So we can see that SACTU's internationalism clearly demonstrates the principled solidarity that marked SACTU's struggles during its first decade. So SACTU's motto was, an injury to one is an injury to all. So now SACTU going underground. So in 1965, SACTU was driven underground by state repression 
and went into exile in Zambia and black trade unionism lost all of its internal expression until its revival in the 1970s. So following the series of spontaneous strikes by African workers in the early 1970s, particularly in, the Durb in Durban in 1973, um, concessions were won with minimum pay scales for urban workers and the right to strike. So even while basic rights of freedom of association were still restricted. So the Soweto uprising of 1976 also contributed to the development of black trade unionism and the subsequent overhaul of the industrial relations system. So the Durban strikes and the Soweto uprising led to the establishment of the Vaina Commission, which recommended to Parliament in 1979 amendments to the Labor Relations Act that would grant black trade unions legal recognition for the first time and make union registration compulsory. So black trade unionists established um, the non-racial federation of South African trade unions in 1979, and the Council of Unions of South Africa was, were, which stressed black leadership following um, in 1980. And there were several important unions that remained outside these federations. So largely regionally based, um, like Fosatu were non-racial but opposed um, to registration. Among their number were the Cape-based Food and Canning Workers Union and the Western Province General Workers Union and the South African Allied Workers Union, organized mainly in East London and Durban. So in the period of 1979, Black Trade Union activists emphasized the goal of building effective and democratic industrial, industrial strength with strike action built around issues specifically concerning trade unions. So from the mid 1970s, SAC2 still in exile urged unions to affiliate to the United Democratic Front, UDF, the principal grouping of community groups opposing the South African government arguing that the class struggle must progress within a national struggle against apartheid. So SACTU welcomed the 1985 formation of COSATU, calling for a truly democratic center of organized activity for all workers who are determined to liberate our country from its existing oppressive and exploited, exploitive social system. So SACTU, added that as long as the oppressive apartheid regime exists, where the above ground trade unionists face detention without trial, torture and murder at the hands of the police, there will always be a need, there will always be a need for SACTU, which would continue to maintain its underground structures. So after the collapse of apartheid, SACTU dissolved and um, advised its members to join COSATU um, affiliates So apartheid and the working class. So we cannot look at the story of apartheid as just a story of racial discrimination. So we cannot look at the story of apartheid as just a story of racial discrimination. So the aim of apartheid was, it was economic exploitation. So the root of apartheid and racial discrimination um, was profit. Um, this is not something that is uniquely South African. Um, crimes against humanity are driven by exploitation and the pursuit of profit. Um, the migrant labor, the past laws, the poverty wages, the victimization of workers in the workplace, the unemployment, the repression, the imprisonment, the banning orders, um, the execution um, of activists, these are all ingredients of exploitation. So the real nature of the system was class exploitation that forms the basis of apartheid. So um, we, we know that the United Nations, the humani these humanitarian organizations, the church described apartheid as a crime against humanity.
And sec two says, guys, hold up. Apartheid is a crime against the working um, class humanity. It's not just a crime, but it's working class humanity. Apartheid is made up of capitalist social formations. So once we understand this, then it's easy for us to understand the dialectical interrelationship between race, class, and the liberation struggle in South Africa. So we can't talk about race and conceal class. It is in the economic relations of production that we discover why apartheid structures are so vitally necessary for the maintenance of the South African ruling class. So like all human societies, um, South Africa must ultimately be understood um, in regard to the position to the production process whereby human labor power produces the material requirements for the maintenance and the progressive development of social life itself. So as in all capitalist societies, this human labor power is exploited by a non-productive ruling capitalist class which owns and controls the means of production in the interest of capital accumulation and the resultant um, and the resultant political power. So South Africa's uniqueness rests with the fact that class exploitation follows so closely along racial lines with the black and predominantly African working class bearing the burden of the of this exploitation, um, which is a characteristic inherent in capitalism. So in discussing the dynamics of race and class in South Africa, Joe Slova stated that for all the overt signs of race as the, mechanic, as the mechanism of domination, the legal and institutional domination of the white minority over the black majority has its origin and is perpetuated by economic exploitation. So Sektu conducted a fierce struggle against exploitation. I mean, capitalism thri thrives on profit derived from the workers on the exploitation of workers and the deprivation of human rights. So what capitalism did in South Africa, it used many devices to camouflage exploitation, the exploitation of workers. So in South Africa, the device used to create super profits is racial discrimination. So white people perpetuated myths of superiority and encouraged workers to remain divided through racial hatred. Unions were, they tried to divide unions. They, well, they did divide unions along racial lines. So at the root of apartheid was what? It was profit. So capitalism and apartheid were partners in the exploitation and the oppression of the black people in South Africa. So in conclusion, SACTU was not a trade union movement based on racial divisions. So we clearly see that SACTU was not um, a trade union based on racial divisions. As the first non-racial trade union coordinating body, SACTU defended the rights and promoted the aspirations of all workers, regardless of their race and their color. And for this reason, its membership always included a number of white workers who refused to succumb to the pressure to accept a racially divided workforce and white domination in society generally. So SACTU was the only trade union coordinating body in post-war um, South African history to promote working class unity in theory and in practice. So SACTU from its inception committed itself to the political struggle against national oppression with equal dedication. So SACTU rejected the no politics in trade union movements. 
and said to leaders refuse to divorce the struggle for political rights and power from the day-to-day -day struggle for higher wages and improved working conditions. So despite nationalist party legislation and repression, SACTU gained strength on both the union and political fronts, um, organizing drives closely co coordinated with Congress, alliance campaigns, and struck a chord with the mass of exploited workers. So its aim was to um, bring, the tra bring trade unionism, unionism to the vast majority of South African workers, the exploited African working class. So SACTU directly challenged um, the econo economic base of apartheid, the cheap labor system, the entire political superstructure that rests upon what the base of exploitation. Um, it, it was similarly threatened um, as a result. So in the course of SACTU's many organizing campaigns, several new African unions were organized in many cases by workers who had immediate grievances which they wanted settled. Okay, and that is the end of our part two. I do hope that you enjoyed the lecture and have a good day. Enjoy the rest of your day.